Broadcasting System presents The Free Company. For what avail the plow or sail or land or life if freedom fail? Meredith speaking from Hollywood for the Free Company. Today, Melvin Douglas, Claire Trevor, Edward Ellis, Margaret Hamilton, and Charles Bickford appear in a new original radio play, The Mole on Lincoln's Cheek, by Mark Connolly, author of the Pulitzer Prize play, Green Pasture. The Mole on Lincoln's Cheek is the second in a series produced by the Free Company, a group of prominent writers, actors, and radio workers who have organized to give expression to their faith in American democracy. Some of these plays will deal with one or more of the eight basic freedoms assured to all citizens in the Bill of Rights. Today's drama, for example, concerns freedom of speech as applied to teaching. Other plays will cover more general ground. All of them are intended to explain and to illustrate the meaning of our freedom. All of them will be written by America's most distinguished dramatists, including Maxwell Anderson, Sherwood Anderson, Stephen Vincent Benet, James Boyd, George M. Cohen, Norman Corwin, Paul Green, Ernest Hemingway, Archibald MacLeish, Orson Welles, Elmer Rice, Robert E. Sherwood, and John, John Steinbeck. Nine of them Pulitzer Prize winners. And now, Mark Connolly's original radio play, The Mole on Lincoln's Cheek. thrown at them? Oh, but we've been teaching civics since they've been public schools, and 
Well, civics embrace political history. Are you teaching them politics in your class? No. I'm afraid the fifth grade is a little young for civics. That ain't the way the communists feel. They like to get at them young. There isn't any communism in your schools, is there? We've seen signs of it, but it ain't going to get very far. Now, Mr. Roberts and I usually go to the movies on Tuesday night, and if you'd like to come along... Oh, that's very kind of you, but as a matter of fact, I've already made an engagement to go. Oh, that's nice. You going with one of the other teachers? No. Mr. Hunter's going to call for me about eight. Oh, that's nice, too. You must have made quite an impression on the principal. Last year, he never took any of the teachers to the movies. Well, I've known Mr. Hunter for some time. Ah, is that so? Where did you meet him? The summer before the war started. We were both in a teacher's group that was touring Europe. And you met him on the tour? Mm -hmm. Were you there when the war began? Yes. We managed to get out of Germany just in time. On that trip you made, uh, did you go to Russia, too? Yes. Russia, France, Germany, and England. Yeah, I thought so. What do you mean, Mr. Roberts? I was just wondering where Mr. Hunter got some of those radical ideas of his. What radical ideas, Mr. Roberts? No, Clem. Miss Thatcher's a friend of Mr. Hunter's. Okay, okay. Better get our hats if we're going to go to the movies. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Hunter. Were your ears burning a little while ago? Oh, why? Well, I don't think Mr. Roberts approves of you completely. No, I'm afraid he doesn't. If he ever learns you came here on my recommendation, I don't think your fine record in Bridgeton is going to help you. Well, he isn't very cordial now. You know, you don't have to live here, even if he is a member of the school board. Oh, no, sir. I intend to do a little work on him. You know, I'd really like to find out what's behind those fixed ideas of his. Mm, I'm afraid you won't get very far. You ought to see him at a school board meeting. Has he made trouble for you? When I became principal last year, Roberts almost stopped me from using the Clavering textbooks. But didn't you tell him that they were required reading in half a dozen states? Yes, but Roberts acted as though I'd brought the Clavering series personally from Moscow. Oh, goodness. I pointed out that Dr. Clavering was one of the most honored educators in America... I couldn't convince Roberts that he wasn't dedicated to poisoning the minds of school children. Well, but you got the books approved all right. Yes. I hope I won't have him against me on anything this year. The three new board members are all friends of his. Well, you ready? Yes. You want to know what subversive activity I've planned? What? I intend to hold your hand at the movies. Even if they ride me out of town on a rail. <laughs> Second in command. Hmm. John Collar's getting awful tight. Pop, 
Did you know in the Revolutionary War, a lot of the soldiers didn't have any uniforms at all? That's right. They were very poor. Some of them were rich, though. Not many. I bet the smugglers were. Who? The smugglers, like John Hancock. What John Hancock? Huh? The John Hancock that, that signed the Declaration of Independence. He was a smuggler. Who said so? It's true. It's in the book. What book? The history book at school. John Hancock was one of the founders of our country. You remember what happens to you when you tell dream lies. But this isn't a dream lie. It's in the book. And Miss Thatcher had me read it to the class today. I've got it downstairs. I'll show it to you. You bet you will. Wait a minute. I'm going down with you. Get my cap out of the box. What does that book say about George Washington? I, I forget all. But he had false teeth. Mm-hmm. I suppose he was a crook, too. Oh, no, sir. He was all right. How would you know? I like him feeding you kids that stuff. But it's true, isn't it, Pop? Listen, son. They're giving you a lot of anti-Americanism. Now let's get down and look at that book. What's the name of that teacher of yours? I'm here to tell you that you fellas don't know what's going on at that school. When my kid got through talking, I thought he might be just making things up the way kids do. But I saw the things he was talking about printed in the book the kids are learning from. Printed right there in that book. Something ought to be done about that quick. Yes, sir, what do you yes, think we ought to do, Harry? I'll tell you what we ought to do. I want the American Veterans League to make a protest and send it to me as a member of the school board. I'll turn it over to the superintendent of schools Monday morning. Then we'll get action. Will somebody put that as a motion? I move that the Veterans League Millersville unit demand that the school board investigate on American activity. <laughs> dinner with you tonight. Oh, why? I've got to go to a school board meeting. The witch hunters are riding again. In what direction? Toward a bonfire of the Clavering textbooks. But I thought you convinced them last year that... Now we've got three new members on the board, each as reactionary as Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Put an unexpected truth in front of them and they... They'll always kick over the lamp. Tonight, Mr. Etheridge promises to introduce some surprises... I want to go to that meeting. I don't think that would be wise. I'm going just the same. I've got a feeling I'm one of the surprises. Now, I know that last year, the fact that some other school boards had approved the Clavering books persuaded the Millersville board to adopt them. Gentlemen, I maintain this board has had something put over on it. That we can't repair the damage a minute too soon. Before I'm through, I think you'll decide to get rid of these books and the people who are using them for anti-American purposes. Mr. Chairman. Dr. Taylor. As superintendent of schools, I'm included in Mr. Etheridge's generalities, and I believe... I'm not including you, Dr. Taylor. I know you 100% American. Mr. Hunter here is the man I'm concerned about. Now, I don't know whether the whole board has ever read these flavoring books. I doubt the new members have. I read them. I know you did, Mr. Roberts. And I wish I'd been on the board when you tried to stop them last year. But for the benefit of those that haven't read these books, I have a few quotations I want them to listen to. And I think they'll be just as appalled as I was by the dirty, disgusting, un-American statement this man Clavering makes. Listen to this one on page 22, book 4. In many instances, the devotion of the leaders in the fight for independence in 1776 was caused less by patriotism than by the opportunity for what today we would call graft. That's a fine way to help children take pride in their forefathers, isn't it? And look what he has to say about the Boston Massacre, one of the outrages that brought on the revolution. I quote, The mob was at least as much to blame for the Boston Massacre as the troops. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hunter, I'm afraid Mr. Etheridge will find that the book is quite correct on that point. You mean calling American patriots a mob? On that occasion, they really were a mob. That is the main point. It's the whole general attitude the books take, I object to. It's the undermining of our children's confidence in the men who help make America what it is. What good is there in saying John Hancock was a smuggler? All these dirty personal insults to great men's memories. Saying John Adams was a political boss. 
Andrew Jackson was rough and uncultured. Couldn't even spell correctly. He says that about another American president. Dirty personal insults to our American heroes. Now that's swell stuff to feed the mind of kids, isn't it? Gentlemen, if what I've read to you isn't enough to justify throwing out these books and the man who brought them to Millersville, I'm going to show you the damage that's been done already. What happens when Mr. Hunter brings his own picked teachers into our schools and turns them loose on our boys and girls? Ask Mrs. Dayton and her son to come in. Come right in, Wilbur. You come in too, Mrs. Dayton. This is Wilbur Dayton. Sit down, Wilbur. How old are you, son? Ten. Now, I want you to tell these gentlemen just what you told me this afternoon. Well, we were all sitting there, and Miss Thatcher said, Do you know who this is? Wait a minute, Wilbur. Wilbur, are you talking about the geography class on Thursday? Yes, sir. What made it different from any other geography class? Because Miss Thatcher opened her desk and took out the statue. What kind of a statue? Hitler's statue. <laughs> you mean Adolf Hitler of Germany? Yes, sir. Did she tell you what it was? Yes, sir. Did she tell you what the school children in Germany did when they saw the statue of Hitler? Yes, sir. What did they do? They saluted it. And what did you do? Well, she told us what a great man he was, and and then we said, Heil Hitler. All right. You can go now, Wilbur. No. No, he mustn't go. This isn't a fair hearing at all. I should like to question Wilbur. Mr. Chairman, this young woman has no official standing at this hearing, and I don't want this child intimidated. Mr. Chairman, I'm this child's teacher, and if I'm being included in these charges, I have a right to defend myself, too. That's substantially true, Miss Petridge. I think Miss Thatcher has the right to question Wilbur. Go ahead, Miss Thatcher. Thank you. I was told this might happen, and I brought something along with me to show you. It's right here in my purse. Now, I want you gentlemen to look at that statue you heard so much about. I think you'll admit that statue isn't a very accurate description of it. Wilbur, is this what I showed you and the other children in class Thursday? Yes, ma'am. Would, uh, would you call it a statue? Well, it's Hitler. Yes, of course it is. Do you remember what I said it was? Oh, you said it was a toy you got in Germany. Didn't I say I saw children buying them from a man on the street? Yes, ma'am. They cost ten puffin eggs. Didn't I say I wanted to show you the difference between the toys children play with here and the ones they have in Germany? Yes, ma'am. But she made you salute it, too, didn't she? Wilbur, did I tell you to salute it? Some of us did. Yes. And I'd like to show you, gentlemen, why they did. When you pull this string, you see the little arm goes up in the air in a kind of salute. Now, completely for their information, I told them that German children were led to believe Hitler was much more than just a, a human being. He was perfect and above all criticism. But they had to salute even this little figure of him. I know, because I saw it done. Before I said any more, half a dozen of them were raising their arms and saluting it too. Isn't that exactly what happened, Wilbur? Uh, I guess so. You mustn't guess, Wilbur. Is that what happened? Yes, ma'am. And didn't we all laugh when you imitated the little figure and, and raised your arms? Yes, ma'am. When you and Eddie Etheridge said, Heil Hitler, what did I do? Well, you laughed. And what else? You told us to stop. Well, just one more thing, Wilbur. Have you ever heard me at any time say that Germany was better than America? Or that anybody in Germany was better than anybody in America? No, ma'am. Do you remember what I said Hitler was doing to the children in Germany? That they had to obey him like mules. Did I say mules? Like donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Wilbur. <laughs> That's all I want to ask you. All right. You can go home now, Wilbur. Unless uh, Mr. Etheridge wants to ask you some more questions. <laughs> this still doesn't change the fact that the Clavering series is a menace to this town. And I move that we vote on the question of removing them. Yes. Very well, Mr. Etheridge. Is there any more discussion? 
Mr. Hunter, is there anything you'd like to say? There isn't very much he can say. It's black and white. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think I would like to say a few words. The Clavering books were bought by this board on my recommendation. And I must go on record as saying that I have just as high an opinion of them today as I had when I urged you to purchase them last year. They deal honestly with historical truth. That's not the point. There's a lot of things that are true that you don't have to tell children. Mr. Etheridge, what do you believe is the purpose of teaching American history? Why, to instill patriotism. Well, believe it or not, Mr. Etheridge, the great army of decent school teachers in America want our children to be patriotic, too. But I think we have different definitions of a patriot. We teachers believe that a patriot is someone who exerts himself to promote the well-being of his country. That's Dr. Clavering's definition. And it's in the dictionary, too. You say Dr. Clavering's a muckraker. I say he's an American patriot who has written in his books not only the great achievements of our country and the men who made it what it is, but the human aspects of our history that let us see and understand as clearly as possible the living world in which the contributors to our greatness existed. They didn't live on monuments. They were human beings, some weak, some strong, some facing crises with level heads, some merely passionate, some scrupulously honest, some not. George Santayana, one of the greatest teachers America ever had, said those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Now, no one can deny that we're living in a changing world. Its social and economic orders are vanishing in front of our eyes. The chief purpose of teaching history is not to glorify the past, but to ensure the future. And our children have the right to be given history truthfully so that they can use its lessons to solve the problems every human being faces today. The only way to make a child a real patriot is to give him history, not an arrangement of eulogies and flowery obituaries under the guise of history. I'd like to have the floor. Go ahead, Mr. Roberts. Last year... I said the board ought not to buy the Clavering books because I'd been told how radical they were. Well, this year we've got a very bright border at our house, that Miss Thatcher you just had up. And I'm here to say that in the last couple of months she's opened my eyes, and so is Mr. Hunter. And I ain't ashamed to say that when I said we oughtn't to buy the books because they were communistic, I made a darn fool of myself and I ain't going to do it again. I'm behind Mr. Hunter 100%. What you told me this afternoon, you'd back me up. No, I didn't. I just said I'd be here and I'd have my eyes open. Harry, I don't want to get into a fight with you. I just want to ask you this. Has Mr. Hunter convinced you you're wrong? He hasn't convinced me this Clavering isn't a muckraker. Then you're even dumber than I was. Can't you see that you're the muckraker? What are you talking about? Just because I'm American enough? Now, wait a minute. You'll have a chance to answer me when I get through. These Clavering books don't insult and cheapen our great men. You're doing that by implying that they weren't big enough to survive a comparison of their faults and virtues. Now, let me show you what I mean. All our lives, we've been used to seeing pictures and photographs and statues of Lincoln with a mole on his cheek. Right here. And if any painter or sculptor dared to show us Lincoln without that mole, there ain't nobody over eight years old in America wouldn't say, put that mole back. We know it don't make him look like a movie hero, but he didn't happen to be a movie hero. So you put that mole back. Because that's the way he was. It makes him realer to us. We want him tall and lanky, with big knuckles, and forgetting sometimes to have his pants pressed. We know Lincoln pretty well. We ought to know America just as well as we know Lincoln. Now, if it's parts of this history that ain't pretty to look at, let's face the facts, and then make improvements as we get a chance to. 
Do you want to see what happens to a country that has nothing but little tin gods in it? Look at Germany. School children there are being taught on your system. All their leaders are perfect. And all their histories are being rewritten to prove it. Well, you want our kids to be told about America that way? We know that everything considered, it's one of the best countries ever organized. We want to keep it that way. And that means not being afraid to learn what made it tick in the beginning and what keeps it going today. Now, it's getting late, and there's a question before the board. But if you ain't convinced yet, I'm prepared to sit here all night to get it through that thick skull of yours. last night? No, but I talked with him this morning. He told me how they voted. Well, we're safe for another year. Yes, darling. We'll always be safe. As long as there are Americans like Mr. Roberts to keep his eyes open. Freedom, then, has this meaning, that here in our land, the truth may be taught, always. Academic freedom is the first liberty to die when dictators rule, for dictators know the power of education. Let us, like Mr. Roberts in the play, keep our eyes open for truth. Let us resist any attempt to suppress truth or to distort it. Let us consider again the most powerful words ever spoken against the enemies of man, the lightning-charged words of Lincoln at Gettysburg, and let us renew in this threatening hour his high resolve that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. In this, the second of our series of broadcasts, the stars and the author of today's drama join the free company under chairmanship of James Boyd, contributing their services without payment. Lee Stevens composed and conducted an original musical score. The free company producer is Charles Vanda. To the Screen Actors Guild and to the American Federation of Radio Artists and to the Columbia Network, all who have combined to make this series possible, to all these people with a word of a special thanks to Irving Reese, who directed, this is Burgess Meredith offering the sincere thanks of the free company. All those who enjoyed Mark Connolly's play today will be glad to know that a complete copy of the broadcast has been printed for distribution to listeners. For ten cents, the cost of printing and mailing, you may receive your copy. Write to The Free Company, in care of the Columbia Broadcasting System, New York City. Copies of subsequent Free Company plays will be made available each week as the series goes on. All criticisms of historical facts contained in The Mole on Lincoln's Cheek are based on authentic conditions. There is no flavoring series, but you will find the names of the actual textbooks containing the controversial facts used in the play in Howard K. Beale's Survey of Teaching, which he prepared for the Commission on Social Studies of the American Historical Association. Next week at this time, the Free Company presents An American Crusader by Robert E. Sherwood, author of Abe Lincoln in Illinois, and There Shall Be No Night. Starring Francho Tone and a distinguished company. 
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.